Stuart Sutherland, yeah. which philosophers have had the greatest influence upon you in the formation of your philosophy and ideas? Well, I, one of the earliest ones was that strange amalgam, Plato-Socrates, because of course we only know Socrates through Plato, and Plato had his own views distinct from Socrates, but on the other hand, if you read a book like The Republic of Plato, a great deal of what Socrates came out, and that had immense impact, because Socrates asked questions and you gave an answer, and then you saw the counter-arguments, and that was marvellous. But the other two really big ones are Hume, David Hume, uh, and his work on dialogues concerning natural religion, I think is one of the greatest works in philosophy of religion. And then most fundamentally, Immanuel Kant, who I think set the parameters of the questions we can ask. So with regards to, say, David Hume and his dialogues, yeah. which character would you most identify yourself with? Cleanthes, Demia, <laughs> Philo? Well, I, I, I suppose in the end um, I'd like to think I identify with Hume because he was playing an elaborate game and his voice comes through in each of the characters, uh, a bit of Hume in each one because he was actually, although in the end uh, he did not accept religious belief in its traditional form, uh, some of his best friends were Christians and so he's sympathetic to uh, Cleanthes for example, but it, you need all of the characters to get a picture of what Hume was up to. And as David Hume didn't actually accept Christian belief, I suspect you don't either. What are the major challenges, you think, which have confronted Christianity and belief in the existence of God? Well, uh, you're right, I'm not a card-carrying member of the church, so I can't put my hand in my pocket and say, there you are, I'm a member. Uh, I think two of the greatest issues, one, uh, the problem of evil, that I'm sure we'll talk about shortly, uh, the other, and this is more the consciousness of the modern world, that is post-1800, as travel was undertaken in a very large form, there's more than one religion in the world with massive uh, membership and massive loyalty and, and huge number of believers. Now, they can't all be right, and I think that's a major problem for Christian theism. So with conflicting truth claims in different religions, are you looking to an uh, objective criteria one to follow, not simply based on their faith claims, mm -hmm. but about their ethical lifestyles? Well, certainly I'd be looking at the uh, shape of the ethical life that they help and encourage. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of one of them being true and the others false. In fact, I think probably there are difficulties in all of them. Uh, but on the other hand, each of the major world religions has insights that we would be foolish to cast aside, even if we can't accept the whole package. Right. You, you mentioned earlier that the problem of evil, the idea that if God is omnipotent, if God is omniscient, if God is all, all good, omnibenevolent, mm -hmm. why does evil exist? Is that an insurmountable obstacle as far as you're concerned for Christian understanding of God and I, accepting yes. that? Yes, I think it is, because I, I mean, it, it, God and the Christian tradition is meant to be all-powerful, is meant to be all-knowing, in other words, knowing what's happening in, in his world, and he's also meant to be totally good. Now, if all of these three are true, um, there shouldn't be a place for suffering of the innocent, particularly that form of evil, but many other forms of evil as well. So I, I think it's a showstopper. So, so you don't accept, say, scholars like John Hick, who in the Irenaean tradition would say mm. that human beings are made childlike, we grow, mature and develop into adulthood and to that extent virtues are better hard won than ready made mm. and there's an eschatological justification. When we get to heaven yeah. we can explain why we've had to endure this suffering. You don't accept the Hicks theodicy? No, in the end I don't. Um, one, I, you know, questions about this heaven we're all supposed to get to, but equally uh, what I would want to press is that uh, if, if life is a kind of moral assault course, that's okay for the fit and the active and those who have you know, all, all the capacities that reasonably they should have. But there are many who don't, and young children especially, before they've developed them, are capable of huge suffering. And I don't see that that is something that you can put young innocent children through in the hope that somehow they will mature into great and good beings. So, so in a sense, your view's similar to that of Ivan in Dostoevsky's mm -hmm. book, The Brothers Karamazov, where there's the, the classic conversation between yeah. Ivan representing the voice of atheism and his brother, Alyosha, a novice mm -hmm. monk. And Ivan is saying that at the end of the day, the innocent suffering, particularly of children, is one of the stories mm -hmm. he cites, doesn't justify mm -hmm. the harmony in heaven. Mm -hmm. 
a very powerful form of atheism yes. insofar as it accepts the existence of God mm. and God is rejected on moral grounds. Mm. Ivan, in a sense, returns his ticket classically. Mm. Mm. He says the eventual harmony does not justify it even though there is heaven. Mm. Lord Southern, if we were to give you a ticket <laughs> and you right. were to be Ivan Karamazov, right. would you return your ticket to God on moral grounds? Would you reject yeah. God? Yeah. Yeah. Say, yes, you do exist, yeah. but I want to have nothing to do with you. You're ticket, morally obscene. Yeah. Ticket to membership of this world that God created, God who is good, omnipotent, and all the rest. Yeah, I'm afraid, and if, if, since I'm to be Ivan, you better be God, and I'll give you the ticket back. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'll tell you why. I mean, these two brothers, Alyosha and Ivan, they hadn't seen much of each other, and the, the chapter in the novel, and it's a great, great novel, uh, is called The Brothers Get Acquainted. And they meet in a pub. And the great issues of, of religion and theism and Christian theism are debated between them. And Ivan, in the end, he's the intellectual in the book, amongst the three brothers. In the end, as you say, the price of the suffering of the innocent is too high. He doesn't make a great drama. He doesn't get up and shout and roar and stamp and so on. He just, I merely and most respectfully return the ticket. I don't want to be part of this picture of the world. And he, he rejected on, as you say, moral grounds. So, with regards to evil, mm. if it's not the, a, a deity to be responsible, because there is no deity, mm. how do you come to terms with that in the world? Because we, we can't deny that there mm. is suffering, there mm. is evil. Mm. 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 Where would your account and explanation of that come from? Well, it, it's not for explaining. It is for confronting. And if um, we are limited beings, creatures, the Christian theist would say, just limited uh, beings, uh, who have got here by whatever route, whether evolved, and I'm sure evolution is a major part of it, if we are, one of the realities we face is uh, suffering, your own suffering, uh, but perhaps morally, much more importantly, the suffering of other people. And you can either view it as something you stand back from, and there was a bit of that in Ivan, actually. I, mean, I didn't see him rushing off to try and change the world in some way. But uh, if that's part of the reality, to be uh, as whole a human being as you can is to confront that. Do what you can, and you start, uh, not necessarily great schemes, you start with the people round about you, next to you. And if you're a teacher, you be a good teacher and you do the best that you can for those who come to your, to your school, and so on. So, on one level, what you're saying is that perhaps we shouldn't live life on the macro level. Life is more understood on the micro, on our relationships which yeah. we establish and the communities which we build. We can all do our part, yeah. and if we focus on enough sufficient drops, yes. we don't know where we'll be going, but we're, we're doing something for the good, yeah. for the better. So, I suppose what I'm trying to ask is, would you accept the free will defence, but without reference to God? i.e. it's yeah. up to us to use our freedom responsibly to do what we can whilst we're here. Perhaps it's agnosticism as to what mm -hmm. lies beyond, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we can be a force for good. Well, I, I do believe we have, we have sorts of freedom that we can exercise. Uh, it doesn't mean to say we can do anything we like, of course we can't, but we have the capacity to decide what to do now, tomorrow morning. And one of the great questions regularly asked by, by um, existential philosophers is, uh, what must I do? Uh, can I choose yeah. to do X or to do Y? And yes, very often you can. You can't eliminate world famine yourself. Some people reach positions of influence where they can change that a bit. But you can actually make a difference now, tomorrow, in, ha in how you are, and in, in how you live in your family, in how you do your job, uh, the kind of job you want to do and you're happy doing. What must I do? A fundamental question that's always forced on you. And I think that's, that's where you start. If we go back just slightly mm -hmm. with regards to Ivan, and if we presuppose that God does exist mm -hmm. and that you were granted just mm -hmm. one question to yep. put to God, yep. Yep. what question would that be? Well, one of the great philosophical questions I really think puts the, 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 the issue very sharply why is there something rather than nothing? Why is it that there is a world at all? I mean, there was a sort of, was there a shortfall in, in, in what God had up there in heaven that he had to create a world? Uh, if you think in theistic terms, why did you do it? What's the point? And what's supposed to be the outcome for us? You wouldn't, or would you accept the classic Christian response whereby they would say God is 
created the world so that human beings can establish a love relationship with God. Mm. Do you think there's something inadequate or lacking in God if God needed to create human beings for that love relationship? Well, all, all, the, all the sort of great exposition of the Christian theistic position assume that God is self-sufficient. And if he is, what need does he have of, of what else there is? I mean, that, there's a separate question, but it, it's, it's uh, pushing beyond the bounds of science. You know, not just how did the world begin, but, but why at all is there something rather than nothing? And I think that's, that's the most puzzling question. You mentioned earlier David Hume, mm. and he famously asserted that you can take any volume of divinity, any school of metaphysics, yep. and they should be cast to the flames yep. because they contain nothing but sophistry uh, and illusion. In a sense, as I understand it, with regards to Christian theism, you've taken the volumes of divinity, mm -hmm. the faith claims, mm -hmm. and rejected those. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you've done the same with regards to metaphysics. Am I right in saying that for some, mm. you, you're in the Platonic tradition, which you mentioned earlier, mm. that you do believe that our life, which we live in a good life, corresponds to an awareness in the univer universe mm. of the good? Mm -hmm. are, you are you still holding on to a, a metaphysical dimension? Well, I mean, just, just to get the record straight, I haven't cast all the writings of religious people into the flames. Right. I actually think there are insights in there that all of us can benefit from, because they too are searchers for the truth. Uh, but um, Hume was, in his usual way, being mischievous and ironic and sceptical and questioning and probing. And what he was saying was, basically, if you're going to make a claim about how things are, let's see what the fact and the evidence amounts to. And can you justify this belief? And I wouldn't dissent from that for one minute. But what I think, uh, where I think there is, there is a difference, and you know, this is, this is the wrong league I'm in, but where I think there is a difference is that I would be inclined uh, not to throw the works of metaphysics into the flames, but ask myself, what was it they were trying to do? And why did they think it so important? Because these writers, they were not fools. They were very sophisticated people. And they thought there were questions, I mean, like the one I've just asked God, apparently. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? I think that's actually an intelligible question, even if there isn't a clear answer on the grounds of empirical evidence. If we can focus on, mm -hmm. perhaps for a moment, the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, am I right in saying that you don't accept the traditional Christian view of, of theology from above, Jesus being the yes, incarnate yes, Son of God, yes, yes. That, that, yes. That, that's, that's not part of your philosophy. No, no. But in God, Jesus and belief, you seem to start with a theology from below, mm -hmm. you recognise mm -hmm. Jesus yes. as a Jewish yep. man, yep. and actually re recognise the issue that Jesus points to or shows that the good life is possible to live here and now. Is, is that still a type of platonic overtones there, whereby Jesus points to the good, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. possible for others to follow? Well, the, the two aspects of this. One is, um, clearly Jesus, like many other great religious leaders, exemplifies forms of goodness in what we know of him. And don't forget, that's sort of patchy. It's a series of writings about him. That's what we have. In what we know about him, he exemplifies a form of belief. But it, I don't think, it's certainly the claims of Christianity are not that simply he's a good moral example and the best that is going. And I think if you're going to take seriously the insights that are there, um, there's a suggestion that he is an embodiment of good. And this takes you beyond, oh well he's a pretty good example, and you know, Nelson Mandela is marvellous, and, and Desmond Tutu, Archbishop yes. Tutu embody, they, they, they show, they exemplify forms of goodness. I think the Christian tradition is saying, and I, I haven't, I haven't um, ever fully understood this, but I think it's worth hanging on to the Christian tradition of saying somehow he embodies goodness. He embodies in his own life the, um, a, a form of goodness, of self-giving, of self-emptying, that I think is very distinctive. Now maybe you can find an example of this elsewhere. Maybe there are in other traditions uh, cases, but he does it, and this is part of the Christian insight, I believe, he does it by being a single individual, not a set of principles not a set of rules, but by being a single individual that lived in a way that, as I say, doesn't just sort of pick up a principle and apply it now and again, or answer a moral question by saying, oh, well, I've, the answer is this, that, or the next thing, but actually lives the goodness um, that, again, the Christians claim he is. 
But what I, I can't see is what it adds to that, uh, to add what I think is the largely unintelligible claim that um, uh, there is a separate figure called...